Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the post-lunch second half of day two of our COVID as a Catalyst for Change virtual fly-in on uh, health equity and policy. I'm excited for our current session, which is the role of science in federal government research and policy. We have three amazing guests with us. Uh, first, we have a pair uh, of Triple AS STPF Fellows. What is that? This is the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, hosts the Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program, where over 250 uh, postdoc uh, scientists are placed in federal government agencies uh, to help um, guide it, those, uh, those agencies' work with their scientific knowledge. And so we have in that capacity, Dr. Stephanie Guerra uh, and Dr. Shakiria Cohen, both of them are placed at the Department of Veterans Affairs, which is an agency that uh, many uh, projects are done in collaboration with FIU. And we have our own FIU alumna, Amy Kennedy, who is health, health scientist administrator at the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, NIH. And uh, in her role, uh, Dr. Kennedy uh, is in charge of health disparity or in coordinating health disparities research projects at the, uh, the MCI. Uh, so she has a, a very relevant uh, role to what we are talking about here today. Thank you so much to the three of you for being here. Um, I'm going to, to start um, with, well, for all three of you, I guess the most important question here is, and, and I'm gonna mention that all three of them are speaking in their personal capacities from their own opinions, insights, and experiences. For all three of you, what role do you think science does play in public policy and, and the federal government and what role should it play? And uh, what do, do your specific positions do to work towards that in, in, in any way? So for our AAAS fellows, you know, what, how does that program uh, align with this question? And, and for Dr. Kennedy, uh, while you're on the research side, not policy side, um, you know, might that influence policy in some way based on, on your findings? Uh, you know, let's start with uh, either of our AAAS fellows. Sure, I can jump in. Um, so I am a AAAS fellow placed at the VA Office of Research and Development. So at least in the role that I, I'm in currently, um, there's a very clear role for science. So the VA, as some of you may be aware, is the largest integrated healthcare system in the country. We serve over 9 million veterans each year. And the work that I do in the Office of Research and Development is to fund researchers across the country who are working in the VA uh, health system and then take Basically, I do special projects to take the, the research and evidence that they produce and connect it to the policymakers and the programs at the VA so that they can develop policies and programs that are based on evidence and research. So it's a very clear line of taking science and scientific findings and then implementing them to really improve care for veterans. And I think that happens to varying degrees across the government. Um, obviously, the NIH, and Amy can speak to that more, um, also is a, is a huge funding agency, and so they do work to fund research that may ultimately influence policies that occur within the federal government. Other agencies um, also, um, there was recently an evidence-based policymaking act that happened that's really been encouraging agencies to look at the programs that they have and see whether or not they've actually been making a difference. So there's been a large push lately at the federal level for evaluation of programs and understanding whether or not the money we're putting in is actually um, leading to uh, evidence-based changes. Um, so there's a lot of uh, really great ways to input into the government with science. Um, though I will say science is just one of many, many inputs that is used by policymakers to make decisions. And that makes the work we do very exciting. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think a lot of times scientists go into the government and think, well, if I just tell them the facts or I just tell them the evidence, then that will make them implement a policy. But 
science is probably close to the bottom of the list in terms of the number of influences that uh, decision makers have to account for when they are ultimately making decisions. So it's, it's an important influence in my mind, but it's, it's just one of many. So um, I totally agree with Stephanie. Stephanie and I are actually part of the same um, Office of Research and Development, although I'm in a different group. And so my group is called the Million Veterans Program, um, MVP for short, if you want to go read more about it on our website. But basically our program is geared towards uh, recruiting a million veterans. And now we're trying to surpass that number um, into a special program in order to um, identify how lifestyle changes, um, genes and military exposure actually influence health of veterans, like how um, it makes them more at risk because we know veterans are a special population of individuals and many of them go to other countries and they experience a lot of different things and they're exposed to a lot of different conditions in which we are not exposed to in the States. And so what we're finding is that veterans who are exposed to different environmental conditions um, have this, have similar like risk of certain diseases that we may not have or what the general population may not have. And so uh, like Stephanie said, science is helping to influence policy. I'm actually part of a group that's helping to write policy on how we can um, increase like access to this database that we're developing in order to um, for more researchers to have access and they can do more evidence-based research in order to um, create discoveries that will ultimately help these veterans live uh, more pro productive lives. So um, as Stephanie stated, science is a small portion of it, but helping to bring our expertise to the government helps them to make better informed decisions on what is needed to improve the society um, so we can have a stronger nation. Yeah, and I think just to piggyback, so as I mentioned, I'm at the National Cancer Institute, so um, thinking of NCI and then NIH in general, um, I sort of think of ourselves as sort of the backbone and first step in creating the evidence that's needed for health policy. Um, so NCI, you know, we have a billion dollar annual budget. We're the largest cancer funder in the world. Um, what we fund either extramurally to universities or what our intramural scientists do, um, you know, directly impacts policy. So for instance, you know, we do clinical trials looking at like efficacy of screening um, or different things like that. Um, we just started a study that's looking at HPV testing in the home setting to see if that could get FDA approval. So I mean, that directly um, up the chain, down the chain, how you look at it, uh, goes into practice and policy in that, you know, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, they look at evidence base to create their, you know, health guidances and suggestions. And so I feel like we are a very crucial role to that. And then I would just add um, a lot of, of course, you think of like NIH and you think of the science, but a lot of what we do is also reporting. Um, and so we get constant like congressional, HHS, different level um, requests, data requests, you know, what are you doing in this field? What, you know, what are you planning on doing here? And, you know, just in my time at NCI, I've seen you know, that sort of turn into not necessarily a policy, but it might be a certain set aside in the budget. Um, you know, the cancer moonshot, for instance, uh, the Bill Biden cancer moonshot, that was something, you know, that uh, Vice President Biden had led. Um, it was a specific, you know, cause and aim, and it was based on sort of our sales pitch to them on, you know, why we need it. So I think um, there's lots of ways that, you know, even though we're not directly involved in policy, but what we fund and do does uh, in the chain of things, you know, affect it. Thank you all for that. Amy, if I could ask you something about the NIH so that we have a broader understanding of how health disparities are being addressed in our health research. Do all centers within NIH, of which there are, there are many, uh, focusing on different areas of research, have a health disparities coordinator or program? If so, how do they work together? If not, how did the National Cancer Institute decide that it was an important one for, for your unit? Yeah, so the NIH, just a little background, so we're made up of 27 institutes and centers. So Cancer Institute, you know, infectious disease, you see Dr. Fauci, he leads that institute, and then 25 others. Um, so we're the largest. 
there he is. <laughs> um, we're the largest. So our setup is different than, you know, an institute that has a hundred people total. Um, so we have, but to answer your question is yes, every institute and center has a focus on disparities. So whether it's a couple of programs or a couple of staff members, a program, a division, that sort of varies. Um, we at the NCI have an actual center to reduce cancer health disparities where they focus primarily on training. Um, but then in each of our divisions, so we have like the basic division, translation, population sciences, um, they also, have, so I'm in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. So we have our own health disparities, myself and my senior advisor, people. Um, but the program's huge. And I think it's been up to leadership on to emphasize sort of how important it's going to be. Uh, we're lucky Francis Collins is important to him. And then at the NCI, currently Ned Sharpless, previously Doug Lowy was our acting director. It was a top priority. Um, and our division director, Bob Croyle, um, is also one of his top priorities. So in our division, uh, about 75% of all of our grants uh, is health disparities related, which to give you context, um, I wrote it down here. So last year, 2020, like that's over $406 million. So it's a huge portion. Um, I guess if we had leadership that didn't think it was as important, it wouldn't be reflected. But I think it also shows those are the applications we're getting. Um, so the investigators themselves know it's important. Um, and so that's sort of how that works. And in regards to working together across the institutes, um, so there is actually one institute, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. So they're trans disease, um, you know, they cover all disease types. So they sometimes coordinate, um, I mean, they have committees and working groups, but that's a big thing at the NIH is working groups and committees. So, you know, I sit on a trans NIH rural group. Um, I sit on a cancer disparity, a uh, genetic disparities group. Um, some of the smaller offices, like the Women's Health Office, the Sex, uh, sex and Gender Minority Office, they have different committees. Um, we work on co-funding. We write our funding announcements together. So, I mean, there's obviously a lot of overlap. For instance, if we're looking at risk factors of cancer, um, you know, the institute involved in alcohol abuse, they might be interested. Um, if we're looking at pediatric cancer, well, then the Childhood Health um, Institute must be, might be interested. So we look, work constantly uh, with different program staff from across the NIH. Thank you for that. Back to our uh, two fellows, uh, so Shay and then, and then Steph. Can each of you share a little bit about your personal story of completing your PhDs and deciding that what you wanted to do with that scientific knowledge and expertise was to uh, affect policy by applying to a program uh, like this one. And uh, feel free to share a little bit about your own research backgrounds, which um, I believe uh, both of you at least have some uh, experience with, uh, with cancer research uh, relevant to what Amy's up to. Okay, so, um... Yes, what made me like really interested in going into like the policy field is while I was in graduate stu school obtaining my PhD in biomedical sciences, I had an opportunity to participate in an outreach program that was geared towards raising the awareness of uncontrolled hypertension in African-American men. The name of the program was called Cut Hypertension and I was chosen to be chair by this um, student-ran organization. And so basically what we did, um, it was health professional students. We went into barbershops in low income communities and we basically spoke to the men about uncontrolled hypertension in African-American men, how it's the number one killer among African-American men. We also spoke to them about um, different resources of where they can um, be treated in case they do not have insurance because um, as many of you may know, individuals who live in low income communities usually do not have um, quality um, health insurance, even if they have any health insurance at all. Also, um, we took the blood pressure, but of course, um, we had to refer them out to like a clinic or to see the um, primary care physician because we couldn't technically diagnose them with having hypertension. But um, what it did was it, it started the men to start thinking about their lifestyle behaviors and what they were doing to contribute to their health. Um, after going to the barbershops for several years, and um, we started at one barbershop and opened up um, several barbershops across the Atlanta metro area, what I noticed is that the environment around these barbershops was similar. 
um, low income communities, of course, suffer from low access to healthy foods. There were a lot of beverage um, stores that sold liquor and other, you know, alcoholic beverages. There also were limited grocery stores. There were a lot of um, fast food restaurants. And so I wanted to know how could I contribute to improving their lifestyle now? Because research we know takes a long time to go from bench to like a market. That takes a very long time. So um, I decided that I wanted to pursue, pursue a policy. Um, where I wanted to pursue a career in policy because policy affect change. And I wanted to know what were all the nuances that went into policies, um, particularly in low income communities in order to keep these individuals kind of like where they were because this has been something that's been going on for decades. And so I'm just really interested in helping to create policy that will impact change in these communities that will make us a stronger nation. I believe we're all interconnected. And so if, if I'm suffering, that means in some capacity you are as well. So helping communities that are in um, need of better access to healthy foods or better health care, that ultimately will make us a stronger nation. So that was my premise. Um, I came from, as you stated, a cancer research background. I studied ovarian cancer and I studied ovarian cancer among um, um, older women because we know that ovarian cancer is one of the cancers that women are usually diagnosed with when they get older. And what we were trying to determine were, were there um, early detection tools that could help these women uh, will improve their prognosis and diagnosis. So I was interested in um, investigating what we call reactive oxygen species, which are little, little reactive um, compounds that are produced as a woman goes through her um, menstrual cycle. And over time, it causes disruption to the, the ovaries. And we're finding that those compounds may lead to markers that could eventually help us detect ovarian cancer at an early age, which now we know that early detection is related to like 90% um, Increased survival, increased five year survival. So, um, so yes, I think for me, I also am a cancer biologist by training. I got my PhD in 2018. And there's really two contributing factors to why I decided I wanted to work in science policy. The first is I did a lot of work in science communication during my time in graduate school, which basically means trying to engage with the public and talking to them and explaining to them more about your research and also having sort of two-way conversations with them. It's not just about uh, talking at them, but talking with them um, and so that they can understand the work that you're doing. And I just found that for me, conversations with non-scientists about my work was so much more rewarding than conversations with scientists. And so I knew that whatever career I did, it would be, um, really emphasizing trying to translate complicated issues so that everyone can understand. It's just a fun challenge and it's something I've always enjoyed. And secondly, um, I was working on developing therapeutics for lung cancer patients and lung cancer in particular, there are a lot of health disparities there, um, particularly African-American men tend to um, die from lung cancer more often than other groups. And, you know, I'm developing all of these, you know, cutting edge treatments. It's this concept of precision medicine where you basically match one type of drug to one type of tumor. It's very um, a tailored approach to treatment, but because it's so tailored, it's also so expensive. And, you know, the only people that have access to those types of treatments are those that go to fancy cancer centers like the Dana-Farber or Memorial Sloan Kettering. And so I guess I was just becoming concerned about the fact that as we start of start to approach the, the point in which precision medicine or access to clinical trials it is saving lives, whether or not that would exacerbate health disparities that already exist, because not everyone has access to clinical trials or to expensive treatments um, for many reasons in this country. And so those are the sort of questions that I was thinking about as I'm pipetting there on my bench and what really drove me to um, policy was to learn more about how uh, health policy works in this country and think about ways to increase access to, to treatments and cutting edge technologies and innovations. And so that's what really drew me here to the VA. And I've kind of come full circle because one of my major projects is working on improving access to cancer care for veterans. So that's been really great to, uh, to contribute to. Thank you both. And then Amy, to, to include a little bit about your background, uh, among anything else you'd like to mention, can you share as our alumna a little bit about your FIU experience and how, if at all, 
that uh, led to your current line of work. And I will say this group already met another PMF alumna and a, uh, a PMF recruiter for the CMS. So it's probably worth mentioning uh, uh, your experience with the PMF program as well. Sure. So I graduated, I guess it was December of 2013 now, um, with my PhD in epidemiology, um, but I did do mine in the lab. So it was genetic epi, and so I too was pipetting. Um, and so that, um, my research had focused on uh, childhood leukemia and genetic risk markers. And I collaborated with investigators at Baylor. So um, we were fortunate to get a large number of Hispanic samples. And um, there's a disparity seen with childhood ALL and that Hispanic, well, overall, um, you know, treatments have come a long way. It used to be a very deadly disease. Now it's not, but Hispanics have not scared as well and their incidence rates are increasing. So I was working on that, uh, looking at genetic SNPs and fun stuff like that. And so during, um, I guess it was my last two or three years of my PhD, my graduate assistantship was actually in the Dean's office. Um, and at that point they were going through CIF accreditation. Um, and so I was helping sort of administratively prep for that, get the students that were gonna be involved in sort of the interview group and just sort of saw all the deans and associate deans and what they did day to day. And at first I'm like, all they do is go meeting to meeting. Um, but then I actually really sort of liked the scientific administration side of it. Um, I'm a neat organized person. I like writing, I like PowerPoints. And so I sort of became interested in it. Um, so when I graduated, I was open, still not sure what I wanted to do, just knew I didn't wanna be a PI anymore, but which was my original goal. Um, I got a fellowship as a Cancer Research Training Award Fellow at the NCI um, in the division I'm currently in, which is an extramural division. So our primary focus is to fund extramural, so to fund universities. Um, didn't really know what that meant going into it, but it was science administration. Um, and that was just a good fit and I liked it. And, you know, all the program directors and staff were you know, similar to me, they had done either up to a postdoc, some had done uh, academia research, uh, in between, but um, it was just something that I liked because you're involved with the science. Um, you don't ever get credit for anything, but you know like you're behind everything. So if you come up with a funding announcement and a grant gets funding and they make this big discovery, you're like, oh, we had a part of that. Um, and so I definitely think the combination of um, my work in the lab and sort of being interested in disparities and then my experience in the Dean's office, you know, liking science administration is why I'm where I am today. Um, so I did trans, uh, I applied to a PMF, as you mentioned, I did a PMF fellowship, um, staying at the NCI. Um, so as you know, I did a couple of rotations and I went to the office a little higher in hierarchy at NCI, it's in the office of the director. So that was a great experience because, you know, I was in my population, silo, population science silo, which is my comfort zone. Um, but now I had to work on, you know, trans NCI. So I had to learn about more mouse models and basic science. I had to learn more about, you know, therapeutic clinical trials, different things like that. Um, so I spent a few years there and then just recently transitioned to my role as health affairs research coordinator at the beginning of the year. Um, so I think collectively, um, everything sort of played a part. Um, when I was in the office of the OD, I, disparities was one of the primary uh, focus areas. So I continued and, you know, I would stay close to the population science division because that was, you know, what I knew best, um, but got to learn a lot of other things. Um, and so that's where I am today, which like, I guess to describe my role is to sort of um, work across our division and then across the NIH and with PIs um, in creating funding opportunities, you know, doing analyses and evaluations of our portfolio to see where are their gaps, um, to speak to the public, to write sort of white papers, um, to do supplements. Um, we, our division does a lot, as was mentioned, like to cancer centers. Um, There's sort of these big, huge grants that we give to 70 plus cancer centers across the country. And I was very happy that your neighbor up the street, University of Miami, my undergrad alma mater, became an NCI designated cancer center, uh, I guess it was last year now, um, because they are really, they can tap into a lot of extra funding. And so Hispanic populations are very underrepresented in a lot of cancer research, as well as 
um, Black, African American, and a lot of other minorities. But I thought that was really important um, because having lived in Miami for 11 years, I knew sort of, you know, what a vast population, you know, to like study and to get involved in research was. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of where I got here today. Um, Thanks, Tamla, and thanks to all three of you so far. The student questions are rolling in, so I'm going to get out of the way and make sure we have enough time to address them all. And I'm going to start with Ina. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ina. I'm a pre-medical student, and I'm also currently doing research on uh, multi-ethnic and multiracial population here in South Florida. And my question is specifically for Dr. Cohen and Dr. Guerra. You both mentioned that science is not the only factor that influence policy. And I'm kind of curious to know um, in the divisions that you work at, what would be the most influential um, in making policies and making sure that the policies work for the population that you serve? Sure, uh, I can take that. Um, so the thing about the VA is it's about the policies, but a lot of it's also about the programs, right? Because we're dealing with real patients, we're a hospital system. So trying to develop programs that work for the patients. Um, so a large part of my work is actually in opioid safety. So we do a lot of programs to give veterans better access to medications to treat opioid use disorder. Um, however, you know, sometimes there, are, even though you know medications for opioid use disorder actually does help patients um, to overcome uh, that opioid use disorder. Um, at the same time, uh, a lot of the other inputs include just like resource allocation, right? So like we're dealing with patients that have all sorts of medical issues from things like cancer, to chronic conditions like heart disease, to even we're in a veteran population, a lot of it has to do with pain management or combat related injuries. And so when we're trying to figure out and develop new programs, resource allocation is a huge issue. So the funding that you have to be able to do it, that comes from Congress. So that's another huge thing is something our health system has that other health systems don't is we have a lot of oversight from Congress. So Congress will put into legislation new funding for a new program, and then it's our job to take that funding and actually make those words on the paper into a reality. Um, and so that's sort of the balance of powers here with the legislative and executive branch is um, we are the implementing arm of what Congress kind of lays out for us and what, what funding they give to us. So even though we might say, oh, the science really supports developing this new program, um, you know, we have to actually have the funding to be able to do that. Um, yeah, so I think it would just be a matter of prioritization, congressional oversight. Um, you, you really need a champion of a lot of these, these things. So someone who who's made it their mission to, to get something done when you're in a large organization, you can't just um, you know, expect a new policy or program to come about. You need someone who's really pushing hard for it because in government change oftentimes happens very slowly. So you really need to keep pushing and pushing. And so that's where the value of, of a champion comes in. I don't know whether Shay has other things specific to her program she would want to add. Yes, um, like Stephanie stated, resources is a um, huge part of the policy making and implementation process. Also for my uh, group specifically, we are trying to uh, recruit a large group of veterans. And so there are what we call stakeholders, which are people who are kind of um, involved in the whole process and they have their own way of doing things. Right, so stakeholders come in and we have to consult with them. They're the specialists, they're the people like the investigators who are in the field actually uh, conducting the empirical data. So although science um, does support that these programs need to be implemented uh, and developed, there are also a lot of decisions that go into it. What are the avenues that we are going to um, use to get this information out to the veterans? What are some of the barriers we may um, face in developing this policy? 
if something does um, occur, how do we create that? So you have to think about all the decisions that go into making a policy, which the science is a large part of it, but then you have to back the science up with, okay, if this happened, then what will we do about this? And just think about all the questions and the individuals that are part of the process. So I think it's a lot of, um, it's a multifaceted you know, pol policy or program. I mean, it's a multifaceted uh, decision-making when it go comes to policy-making because policy in fact change. So you wanna make sure that all the decisions are um, addressed before you actually develop this packet that will actually um, impact someone's life. Vicky? Hi, everyone. My name is Vicky Vasquez. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate. I'm um, getting my degree in public health with a concentration in health promotion and disease prevention. And I'm also a health disparities researcher under an endowment grant with NIH. Um, so I've always been particularly very um, interested in gender and racial based health disparities, specifically in substance use and mental health. Um, I grew up in um, the military family. My dad was a veteran. Um, and so my dissertation is in a different population, um, but I was, uh, I've always been interested in like, you know, sociocultural values and how those impact um, substance use, you know, the opioid use among veterans. And so my question is, are, is there current research being done in the VA system that looks at these sociocultural um, influences such as um, training within the military culture and how that impacts opioid misuse and chronic pain manifestation. And um, my second question is if there are any committees in the VA that are inclusive and they bring in, you know, scient scientists like fellows like you guys to um, help work with congressional individuals to realign the priorities, um, the priorities and um, to get greater funding for specific areas of research? Sure, um, I can tackle the first part of the question. Um, so I, yeah, so a lot of my work is in opioid safety. And so I'm happy to report that we recently developed a new RFA. So RFA is request for applications. Um, so our research program is what's called an intramural research program. That means that the only people that can apply for funding, research funding from the VA are VA researchers. So people who are actually employed by the VA. Luckily, there's a lot of those people all over the country, but they have to be people that actually work within the VA hospital medical system. Um, and so we have for years really funded a lot of opioids research. Um, however, we kind of recently realized that we could be doing a lot more. So we have what we call a standing RFA, which is just like a general RFA that has a list of priorities from things like chronic disease to, um, to care for strokes, care for um, really military exposures, all types of things. And, and chronic pain and opioids was, you know, one of many priorities there. But once I came into the office, I started working on developing a separate RFA that was specifically for opioid safety and opioid use disorder. And so we just released that, which is really exciting. And so this is one specific um, call for applications that have a whole list of priorities um, under them. Some of them are things like thinking about stigma and how we can address stigma, especially when it comes to things like medications for opioid use disorder. They work really well, but for some reason, a lot of it having to do with stigma at the patient provider health system level are still not completely implemented or accessible to patients. So things like methadone or buprenorphine, which tend to really help patients um, get off of opioids oftentimes is, it's not that accessible to patients, unfortunately. So some of the priorities include addressing that stigma. Um, we also have um, a few priorities on that list that are also specifically examining racial and health disparities, but not just describing the problem, but thinking about how we can actually address and reduce those disparities. Um, so I'm really hopeful that we'll be getting some new research applications um, to be addressing those socioeconomic and cultural issues you, you discuss there. Um, and then the second question about congressional, you know, there is, um, because of the balance of powers, there's often a sort of a bit of a wall between 
Congress and people who work at the VA. Um, you know, we, we do interact quite a bit, but, um, and they, you know, they get information from a lot of sources on the Hill, like con congressional people, they will talk to experts. They will talk to people that experts that work at the VA, they'll talk to experts that work at other health systems and use that to help set priorities. Um, but like, we don't work hand in hand with them to tell them what the priorities are. At least I haven't done that. And I don't really think that's something that we, that we typically do. Thank you. you know, either of the two of you want to jump in on that or should I uh, just want to make sure before I jump, move on to that particular question. I, I agree with Stephanie. I do not have much um, experience with the congressional um, side of things. So, and I've only been there one month, so yeah. I'm still learning a lot of the process. Awesome. Christy? Hi, everyone. My name is Christina, and I'm a master's student for uh, global strategic communications. And I love policy. I've worked, had the opportunity to work in it before. So I'm really grateful to be here. And my question is actually for Shay. So I think that the research that you did is really interesting because you focused on these, you zoned in on where you want to get your research from. So my question is, when you do research that regards minorities like this, how do you protect the information and research that you collect once you put it out in order to be able to implement it in policies without having people's unconscious bias affect that and kind of play into that? That's a great question. And so um, we have this system, it's called, um, well, we have this method, it's called de-identified data. Basically the data is only general information. It tells you about the gender of the person, it may tell you about their ethnicity, but it does not give you any personal information about the individual because of course there would be bias if they did have that. So the, uh, with the de-identifiable data, they use that as a basis to, um, for individuals to conduct research. And so as a, um, when I was in cancer research, I actually had access to the individual's entire pathology reports. Mm -hmm. But when I entered it in, the information into my research studies, I had to make sure that I only entered the um, individual's ethnicity and their, um, where of course I was only dealing with women, but their gender. So that's how we're able to protect their information. Now, some research studies, um, where some re researchers do have access to the entire, um, where we'll have access to the entire database that I'm actually developing policy and procedure to increase access, but they have to make sure they sign like a confidentiality call and to ensure that they do keep the information that uh, about the individuals confident, you know, confidential. If they're not, then they are, um, there are rules and regulations in place. So they have to sign a rules and behavior and they have to sign a confidentiality clause to make sure that they are not um, reporting someone's information um, to the public. And if they are, they are held liable for doing this. I'm sorry, I don't think I made my, I think I worded my question poorly. So my question was more of, so when you work with these minority groups and you're creating policies that are going, well, you're hoping to push for policies that advocate for them, we know that inherently our system is racist. How do you push for these policies to benefit minorities without having that racism that's kind of ingrained into our political system affect what you're trying to do? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think I, I worded it correctly. The well, first maybe time. I missed more sense in my head. Well, maybe I misunderstood. Okay, so when we're talking about um, racial disparity or um, any kind of research that's dealing with minorities, it's hard to kind of keep that out of the, the forefront of, um, of it being a factor when people are making decisions. What mm -hmm. we try, what we try um, to do is make sure that we provide empirical data showing how something may be impacting a certain group uh, more than others and how that group will benefit greatly if we are able to implement these policies and procedures. So in order to, um, to push for it, we have to just have people like advocates, people who have worked in the field and people who are actually there in, um, 
for the best interest of the individuals who are, we are representing. Because it's going to be hard for me to show you how important this research is for a group of some for this particular group if you don't have the same sentiments. So we just try to make sure that we advocate for the group. We show the empirical data that's showing that these individuals are in need of this um, these positive procedure that will improve their health and how that will kind of relate back to the better good. That's why I always say that individuals uh, we're interconnected. So if I'm doing well, then that means you're doing well, and it is a whole, we'll, we'll all be able to do well. But if we have one group of here that's disproportionately impacted by um, a disease or some other disorder that others are not, we need to look at that and see why these individuals are being impacted in a negative way versus this other group. Is it just race or is it other factors that we could um, be identifying? So um, I guess to answer your question, it's hard to kind of be impartial. Um, if you are not someone who thinks that way, but we just try to put out the empirical data um, and evidence-based research to really show how these individuals will be um, positively impacted by what we're doing in our office. I hope that addresses your question. Yes, thank you so much. So Max. Thank you so much. My name is Max. I'm a senior studying political science and international relations with a focus on public policy and, and national security. Uh, my question is geared uh, towards Shay, uh, and specifically your work on the Million Veterans Program. Um, my, my question overall is when people sort of uh, provide their data for the program, uh, describing what health conditions they might have or what mil military exposures, you know, there are definitely a whole bunch of organizations outside of the VA that focus on issues such as PTSD, um, suicide, uh, small projects that focus on getting veterans homes. What I'm curious about is that for people who go through these programs versus people who do not go through these programs, is this sort of stated in the data to show how their health might have improved because of the changed socioeconomic status that they might have or the care treatment that they're also getting at these institutions? Or is that information not relevant to the sort of data that's collected overall? That's a great question. And because the um, MVP program is a new program, what we're, um, we only have currently have like 33 um, projects and we're trying to expand to um, a lot more projects. And that's one reason why I was brought on board to expand access in order for more researchers to have access to the data and um, really work on some of the issues that you brought up. Right now, what we're basically trying to do from um, what I, the small time that I spend in the office is we're trying to develop, um, we're, we're trying to develop, well, we're trying to support projects in which um, we understand just basically what disease mainly affects the veterans in, that are being seen in the um, VHA. So currently we're only um, conducting research on, invest, on, on veterans who are being seen at the, um, the VA. So we're trying to you know, get more participants and we will do that, of course, over the time, uh, over the next couple of years. But what they're trying to determine is if the veterans that we um, are seeing, what are the major health conditions that are, that are impacting them? And so we have a specialized um, chip that has SNPs for a lot of different diseases. And when the veterans pr provide their, um, their sample, we're able to determine which ones are at higher risk for hypertension, skin disease, PTSD, or some of these others. So right now we're not trying to really identify the difference between, we're right now we're not conducting that type of research from my understanding, but um, in the future we will be conducting more research trying to understand how the different exposures from different places could impact them. So that is something that's like ongoing and we will be you know, doing during the course of you know, a couple of years, well over the years. <laughs> Thanks so much. Michelle? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Michelle. I'm currently an MPH student specializing in health promotion and disease prevention. Uh, currently, I work in UNISHIN with the College of Nursing and manage a HRSA funded grant that specializes in uh, primary care access for rural communities. Um, a part of this work uh, includes also increasing access to MET training and certification for nurse practitioner students to address the opioid um, pandemic, epidemic. Um, 
as as we know, as we all know, the, there's a current opioid epidemic, and unfortunately, as we've seen in previous literature, this um, drastically affects uh, veterans, as they're more likely to have um, OUD and substance abuse. So, um, with this in mind, my my question is that how has the COVID nineteen pandemic impacted um, care and funding for VA? Um, healthcare on on rural or opioid use disorder amongst veterans? Uh, thanks, that's a great question. Um, regarding funding, the thing with the government funding is that it happens so far in advance. So our budgets come out like, like we're on this budget cycle where like right now, I think we're gonna be working on like an FY22 budget. So like, I don't really know how it's ha it will affect our funding because like our funding was already allocated like way before the COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, I, it's unclear to me how, if at all, this will affect funding specifically for opioids projects. But I will say, you know, COVID-19, as you've probably already seen, you know, has really affected the care for veterans and just anyone who has opioid use disorder. Um, veterans uh, tend to to develop OUD more than the general population for a lot of issues, often because they have more chronic pain. Um, and so we need to have better ways to, non-opioid ways to treat their pain. That's a huge focus of our research program. It's a huge focus of um, a lot of the clinical programs we have where we have something called stepped care, which means there's many different steps you take as a physician to try to treat someone's pain and opioids is, is like a last resort, um, essentially. Um, but in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic effect, it, it's really disheartening. It's, we've made a lot of great progress in, um, we've drastically reduced the prescriptions of opioids at the VA, and we were beginning to really see a downturn in overdoses at the same time. Um, and it was really, you know, exciting. However, you know, we haven't, I don't know what the numbers are now, but I would anticipate that some of that progress has likely been reversed um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, I think there is a silver lining to this pandemic, um, primarily in changes to policies. Um, if you look at the national level, um, there were a lot of policies in which patients could only have, would have to report daily to methadone clinics to receive their methadone. I'm talking about just general population. This is not in the VA, just general population. But then with the COVID-19 pandemic, patients were actually able to get access to longer lengths of prescriptions for things like methadone. So they didn't have to go daily every day. And like that really helps someone maintain um, treatment if, if they don't have to physically report somewhere every day. In addition, um, there were changes to national policies such that physicians could prescribe buprenorphine, which is another drug um, via telehealth, not via in-person um, uh, in person uh, visits. And they could also renew prescriptions via telehealth. That was something that you couldn't do before. This was also within the VA. And so, you know, I'm hopeful. And so that also is another way you increase access to these medications. So I'm really hopeful that, you know, as we're coming out of this pandemic and into recovery phase, a lot of these um, changes to health policies that uh, we can kind of assess how they've affected outcomes, how they've affected um, uh, engagement and treatment and try to you know, maintain these policies even after uh, the pandemic is over because I think access to these treatments um, and increasing access is, is really important. So, and I think that's something that's probably true across other types of medical issues as well, and just other policies in government where there's these new ways of doing things because of the pandemic that actually might have a really positive effect on society. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, we can kind of identify those cha policy changes and sort of even maintain them um, after COVID is uh, over. Uh, just to follow up, I another question, because you opened kind of my mind a little bit. Um, so in terms of telehealth, do you think that would be equally as successful when treating with 
we know uh, opioid use disorder because there's so many things we have to think about. It's not just buprenorphine, um, you know, prescription. There's psychological, um, you know, therapy that has to be done. There's support groups, but it's all different to do that over a screen. Do you think that can impact? Do you think it'll maybe even make it more accessible for for the the veterans? Do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's something that's really going to require some study because you could think, I mean, I think I saw some article about how, you know, obviously there's more access now to, to therapy, right? And this article was saying something along the lines that like, there really doesn't seem to be that much difference in the positive effects of therapy, whether it's telehealth or in person. Um, I'm not sure if that's also true when it comes to uh, therapy that's specifically dealing with substance use disorders, but I think it's something worth studying. Um, I'll also say one of the big things I'm working on now is developing a research agenda for the VA around deferred and disrupted care. And so what that means is looking at how this pandemic has affected utilization of, of healthcare as well as outcomes um, for non-COVID related conditions. So we can see, has this made, um, for men we were looking at specifically in mental health in chronic care and acute care. And so like a quick aside on that is we saw, you know, during the pandemic, a uh, drastic decrease in emergency department admissions. You know, people weren't coming to the emergency room anymore, you know, but that also means people weren't coming because of cardiac arrest. They weren't coming for strokes potentially, like what happened to those patients? And that's something we really need to study and figure out and then hopefully use that information to improve our health policies and our health programs um, during the pandemic and beyond. I agree 100%. I think that it would be even applicable to um, work in rural areas where they don't mm -hmm. have, um, you know, very close access to emergency care or even primary care. So definitely exploring that I think would be a great option. Thank you so much. Yeah. So thrilled about the, uh, the veteran specific questions that are and passion that our students have and that'll frame some of the, the quick closing remarks that my colleague Carlos will, will provide in just a minute. I know Ian has one last closing uh, question for Amy and then we'll, we'll transition to Carlos's closing uh, remarks. Ian. Thank you. Um, so for uh, Dr. Kennedy, I wanted to ask you because, um, you know, we've seen a lot of research over time. You mentioned that 75% of uh, the research running through the NCI is uh, based on health disparities and uh, you know, there have been some other studies that have come out and, and other papers that have come out talking about how long it takes for research uh, that, that runs through the NIH to actually get to the community uh, in terms of, you know, uh, as scientific research happens and knowledge is shared and it builds, uh, the, you know, it can sometimes be five to 10 years even before community interventions uh, are affected by the research. Are there any strategic uh, kind of initiatives to fund more intervention-based research? I'm sorry, uh, for, we're strapped for time. I didn't say I'm a doctoral student in, uh, in, in health and equity, and we're also in health promotion focused on community-based participatory research. So that's, that's where my question comes from. Sure, yeah. And I actually listened to the Donna Shalala thing this morning, and I think you asked a similar question. And I was happy that Dr. Pesquet, um, I won't say used the word correct, but corrected the other woman's comments. We find a ton of CDPR. Um, so the 75% is our division. So that's Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences, um, which makes sense because a basic, you know, our division of cancer biology, yes, of course, you know, genetics and stuff, but we cover that too because we're epidemiology. Um, but yes, we, I believe the statistic, because we have an implementation science team. And again, Dr. Pasquet was one of our, is uh, one of our grantees. Um, implementation science is huge and it's great that it's gaining popularity. Um, there's a lack of people understanding really what implementation science is, which is exactly what you mentioned. I think it's something like it takes 15 years to get 7% of the research into practice. Um, a main focus of our division is exactly what you mentioned. It's CBPR, it's you know, not reinventing the wheel, it's adapting you know, evidence bases and policies and interventions, and whether it's prevention, survivorship, across the cancer continuum, implementing them in, and with a, you know, a focus of health disparities, minority health, 
in diverse populations because of course you can't take an intervention that works in you know black african american urban area to a you know tribal ai area um and so that really is our focus because i don't want to say that we know all the answers it's just implementing of course we still don't know all the answers but we do have so i mean so much knowledge and it's getting it into practice another thing our division does is we you know because we're dealing with population scientists whether they're behavioral um, you know, surveillance, whatnot, epidemiologists, is we get them into sort of a, we offer like businessy type uh, grants. So getting them, you know, if they have this intervention, and it's, you know, usable for an app, we give them money and training to like sell what they've done. Um, so I think that's where like the gap, and as you mentioned, sort of this, it takes forever if it even makes it into practice. Um, but yeah, you can feel free to touch with me, but we do, that is, a heavy focus is getting things in out the door into practical real world because that's what public health is. Um, you know, it's not, I always tell people, I'm like, it's not sexy. It's not fancy because when it works, you think you did it for nothing. Um, but you need to get it into practice in order to see the effects. Great. Thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for answering our students' questions. I'm going to turn it over to my, car my colleague, Carlos Becerra from FIU in DC. And if our, our panelists are able to squeak out just a few more minutes here, we would love for you to kind of hear a little bit about FIU's uh, uh, advocacy for veterans related uh, work. Yeah, and it actually, uh, on the heels of what uh, Amy uh, was just mentioning, uh, blurs uh, all of our presentations. I have been listening and a little tickled pink because so many of these issues of policy research uh, and in particular, veterans uh, are have taken a good amount of uh, time uh, of our team here in FIU and DC. Uh, and why? I just dropped into the uh, the chat uh, some information on the work of one of our uh, biomedical engineering uh, professors and the chair of the department, uh, Dr. Renu Zhang, uh, who you know talk about our as these uh, individuals have proven. Uh, the focus of uh, these individuals' research um, is their life, life's calling and their passion. Uh, and in Dr. Zheng's uh, uh, case, in this example, this has been a project she has been working on for uh, the better part of you know, 15 plus years. Uh, and in short, it is the ability to use biomedical engineering and specific uh, uh, practices to uh, restore sensation to, um, to amputees. Uh, and through the through uh, advanced neural uh, uh, prosthetics, as we call them, um, I won't go that deep into the actual science and technology. But uh, we've been helping uh, promote her work uh, for years uh, with a lot of uh, key agencies that have been funding her. Uh, so she's received a lot of uh, uh, NIH dollars uh, through NIBIB, um, uh, as well as DARPA, um, and uh, most recently in the Army. Uh, but the blurring of the lines of, I heard some of the talk about uh, Congress prioritizing initiatives. Uh, Steph, you mentioned, which is true uh, in VA world, it is intramural, unlike many other agencies, i.e. NIH and others that are, it's extramural where uh, um, university faculty are used to competing. Um, so if we have this technology at FIU uh, that has the potential and the promise to uh, change, transform lives uh, of our veterans, what to do. Uh, our congressional delegation is well aware of the work of uh, Dr. Jung because they've been visiting campus, they've been reading our um, information, we've been knocking on their door, making sure that they're uh, aware of it. So over time, over the last few years, they've been doing their part because Congress does set the budgets uh, and in budgets is priorities. Uh, to emphasize a lot of uh, work in uh, uh, neuroprosthetics uh, within these different budget bills. Uh, but South Florida also has a great champion in Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who happens to chair the committee that writes the bill that funds uh, the Veterans Administration's budget, um, uh, military construction and veterans affairs. So it helps uh, a great deal if the chief lead author on the bill that's gonna be funding the VA is one of your hometown uh, champions. So I'm also gonna drop into the chat uh, some language that over time uh, our delegation has been able to advance. And most critically in the last uh, uh, cycle, uh, the budget has not been uh, 
uh, finalized for the FY21 budget year. But the Congresswoman, and with the support, bipartisan support, uh, was able to uh, embed a nice chunky paragraph here. Um, so you're, what you're seeing here is actual language that exists in the House uh, Veterans Affairs Appropriations Bill that in essence directs the VA to prioritize this area of research um, in a way that is collaborative across many institutions because another, uh, an, another uh, reality is with Congress, uh, we're not living in an era where it used to be that members of Congress could write in a specific uh, $5 million for a particular funding line and write in Florida International University. That's no longer the case. But in our case, we're more than you know, willing and, and, and glad to collaborate with other institutions. But there are a small circle of institutions that are focused on this. Uh, so that's one part. But at the same time, we're working our members of Congress to hopefully write in paragraphs like this. We're no fools. We know we need to do this with the support of the VA. So for the last few years, Dr. Zhang and, and our team has helped out uh, for sure, have been working to make sure that the uh, uh, science research and development office here in Washington are well aware of her work and they are. Um, and they've invited her to, to make presentations and do all that stuff. So we're doing that relationship game here, but also at the local Miami VA, because that is ultimately where you know, the work has to be done. But as Steph pointed out, uh, it, it needs to be intramural funded research. So right now we're actually in the process of uh, ensuring that one of the uh, one or two of the FIU faculty members have a joint appointment. So yes, they're still uh, FIU faculty, but at the same time, they are uh, a member of the VA research um, uh, family. So that is in essence a, a quick little on point. Uh, uh, and to Amy, Amy's point, it's great that uh, Dr. Zhang has this technology, but the next hump is how do you get it commercialized? How do you get it so that you know it's actually mass produced? Uh, so that you know um, folks that are you know producing these prosthetics are able and uh, backing a lot of Dr. Zhang's technology is a lot of private uh, partners and the type of technology and uh, it's very wireless driven. So, um, but that's another part of the game too, uh, because you can have all the inventions of the world, but if they're not cost effective uh, and able to to go to market, you know it's just good as is that so. Thank you for allowing me to chime in. And I want to thank our panelists. I think you, you got a great taste of you know, the key issues when it comes to science and policy and, uh, and how they uh, uh, hopefully work together. And, and so how did I do, Eric? Fantastic. Thanks, Carlos. I love these connections between the research backgrounds of our panelists, between their, uh, their work in the federal government and the work that our government relations team helps our researchers um, and then, so I think that was a fantastic way to close and this has been a fantastic hour. So I'd like to once again, thank Dr. Shakiria Cohen, Dr. Stephanie Guerra and Dr. Amy Kennedy for uh, their time with our students this afternoon. I appreciate you all very, very much. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Steph. <laughs>